Tom Grace was born and raised in Michigan. His lifelong fascination with science, arts, and technology led him to study architecture at the U of M in Ann Arbor. During his years at the U of M, Grace started writing 30 minutes each day during lunch. This laid the foundation for what would become his first novel, Spiderweb. The author architect self-published his first novel in the spring of 1997. Since then, Tom has continued to write and his books are being well received. And he has just agreed to a three book deal worth nearly $1 million. Tom, welcome to the Author's Den. Glad you could make it today. Tell us, what do you do for a living? Uh, professionally, I'm an architect and uh, writing novels is sort of my passion. And what's nice about it is that I now have two jobs that um, I enjoy doing that I get paid to do. How about a little background about yourself? Um, I grew up in the uh, suburb of Livonia, just outside of Detroit. Um, essentially spent my entire life there. Uh, went to Detroit Catholic Central. Um, later on went to the University of Michigan. So I pretty much stuck within 50 miles of where I was born. Uh, just born over in Royal Oak here. And, uh, and now I'm just outside of Ann Arbor in uh, the Dexter area, out in the farmlands. Talk about your career before writing and how writing began for you. I didn't start off being a writer. In fact, I didn't even go to school for it. I went to school to become an architect, and then I spent six years in the University of Michigan getting the degrees that I needed. My, you know, I had to get a master's degree in order to practice architecture, so I went straight through six years um, and spent the better part of the uh, 1980s um, doing what I needed to do to become a professional architect, doing my, serving my internship, taking my licensing exams, working for the firms, and, and building my career. Um, and then in 1990, uh, I took a position with the University of Michigan as an in-house architect with the medical center. And the difference between that position and previous architecture positions that I had was I went from presenting things like the Corvette Museum down in Louisville, Kentucky, and, and skyscrapers and, and glorious projects like you know, the Southfield Library type projects to uh, replacing MRI machines. And by the way, the rooms are all going to be beige. I couldn't even pick the colors of the rooms that I was working in. So for someone working on very creative projects to suddenly go to work that was very technically challenging but not most creatively challenging, uh, you need a creative outlet to do something. And you, either you turn to homicide one way or the other, and I decided to at least do my homicide on paper. Um, I'm an avid reader, and that's how most writers become writers, is the fact that they devour books and they read a lot. So I've been reading since I was a kid. I just devour books. And I always had that goal out in the back of my head that someday I'd like to take a shot at writing one just to see if I could do it. Um, because it is a, a pretty hard thing. And, Prior to writing my first novel, the longest thing I'd ever written was a 20-page term paper. And the question I ask you, can I hold a coherent thought in something longer than 20 pages? Can I actually tell a story that works? And um, I set out during lunch hours at uh, 30 minutes a day. And within a year, I had the, the first draft manuscript for my first novel. And I discovered along the way that it's a lot of fun. You know, I'm curious. When you were younger, did you have any uh, books or authors that inspired you? Well, Lord of the Rings is one that I've always enjoyed, and I've read that one several times, and now it's back in vogue again with the movies and all that. Um, you know, as a teenager, like most teenage boys, I read a lot of science fiction, so a lot of Asimov. Um, as I got older, my tastes tend to uh, more of the techno thrillers and historical uh, books, that type of thing. Um, now I'm all over the map. I read just about everything I get my hands on. Did you participate in any reading program or a competition when you were younger? No. No, we just uh, had a lot of reading uh, to do at school. We always had summer books that we had to read um, you know, before school started, and then a lot of things through the English classes. Um, I've always enjoyed English. I've always enjoyed reading, so I never had a problem reading what was required plus whatever else I wanted to. Um, I always had a book going. It's obvious from your books that you have a great interest in science and technology. Talk about how that came about. My interest in science uh, can date back to uh, several very good teachers that I had at Catholic Central. Um, one in particular my, uh, in, during my senior year was uh, Ray Paramo, who uh, taught physics and really opened my mind up to how physics works and how it operates in the, in the world around us. Um, I have a fascination for physics. I don't have the brains to handle high energy physics as is done today. Certainly the kind of things that are going on with M theory and 11 dimensional universes, I have a lot of trouble even trying to figure it out. But I've been able to work with some very good researchers who've kind of guided me along the way and spoon-fed it. So I have a, a very general layman's view of uh, cutting-edge science. But I'm fascinated by it and all the things that are going on. So I try and incorporate that in my books. Because science is what propels the world forward as we do these explorations, into, whether it's biotechnology or physics. Um, it, it moves things forward. And, and how we apply that new knowledge into creating new inventions and new technologies you know, creates entirely new economies. We're doing things now that weren't thought of 20 years ago just because we have new materials to work with and new science. And as every time we get a new understanding, uh, be it in physics 
where we move from Newtonian physics to Einsteinian physics, that changes everything and allows us to go from uh, simple machines and, and railroad trains to atomic weapons and high energy jets and computer chips. I and mean, just that, that understanding. And we're, about, we're on the cusp of one of those things again. And I find those kind of uh, events in history fascinating. So if you read the history of the inventions as well as the inventions themselves, uh, they're, they're all fascinating stories. And that's what I'm interested in. And I've crafted my fiction around events like that. Okay, now take us back to your first novels. Tell us about the lead character and what you were going for in those books. Um, engineers are said to know an awful lot about very little, and architects know little about an awful lot. So I had a very general, broad, broad background in a lot of different subjects, and I worked in a lot of different high-tech facilities. And in looking at the kind of things I wanted to do, I see, you know, there's people out there who do great political thrillers and you know, spy thrillers, that kind of thing. And I really didn't want to get in that market because I have no background in the CIA or, or you know, in politics in Washington and all that. And what I was interested in was in science and technology. And that's when I came up with the idea of working through the Intellectual Properties Office at the University of Michigan. The idea that all major universities, research universities in the United States, develop intellectual property. They develop new knowledge, things that they can patent, things that they can license out. And they make money licensing this technology out to companies. Um, Michigan State generates a huge amount of revenue from a drug called cisplatin, which is one of the main chemotherapy drugs in the world. It was invented by a U Michigan State researcher. U of M has similar products, MIT, Stanford, they all do this. And the idea was that I could place a character in this environment that would expose him to all these different technologies being developed. Because once a new technology is developed, it becomes valuable. And that's when you get greed and murder and all the other fascinating things that make a thriller a thriller. The fact that something is valuable and someone would want to steal it. Well, that gives us a pretty good overview. But now, tell us a little bit more about the characters. I have seen many interviews with many authors. And when they write serious type fiction, uh, be it Tom Clancy or Clive Cussler, you start to get a sense that somewhere embedded in their hero is a bit of themselves. And it's sort of the Walter Mitty syndrome uh, that all of us authors tend to have as we tend to bury ourselves in our characters at times. Um, our, my character is an alter ego. He is you know, a red-haired Irish guy from Michigan. Well, that, that pretty much is me. Um, we share a lot of the same interests, the same books, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of his activities and physical attributes, he and I, you know, we're both runners, we're both swimmers. It's just that he does everything better than I do. Um, I guess the only uh, balancing on that is that I'm God in his universe, so I, I get to push him around. But yeah, so, so there's no ego problems here. Um, Nolan Kilkenny is, is sort of my, alter, my fictional alter ego. Um, he uh, is involved with a, a very beautiful and bright uh, physicist at the University of Michigan who bears an uncanny resemblance to my wife. Um, and other characters that float in and out of their lives are based on you know, people that I know or collections of, of people fused into different characters. Um, so that's how I sort of created the world of Nolan Cook Kenny. Uh, and it's certainly based on the real world of the University of Michigan, but it's populated by fictional people. Your books have covered many topics and take place in many different locations. Can you talk about that process? Did you travel? Half the fun of writing my books is doing the research and in, in, in getting into it and actually getting into the story itself. Because as you, as you work on it, you develop questions, one question after another, and things just lead on. Um, in dealing with the science, um, I may give a physicist a call at University of Michigan or down at Notre Dame or whatever, depending on what they're working on, and the next thing you know, I'll end up in a salt mine under Lake Erie, watching photons decay, or hopefully watching you know, protons decay, that type of thing. Or um, I worked with a physicist with Twisted Web, um, because he had done a lot of research in the South Pole and actually lived for seven years at the Russian base Vostok, which is featured prominently in that book. Um, in my novels, I try and go to the far-flung places around the world that I can get to, and getting to the South Pole is a very difficult thing. So I had to rely on, on this person's first-hand experience of being at Vostok Station in the South Pole. Um, as one of the side benefits, I ended up going to the North Pole with him so I could at least see what polar research really looked like. Um, so I try and do these kind of things. It, it, it adds the, 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 uh, the great word is verisimilitude the believability of what I'm writing about, the fact that I can put the reader in that place, uh, what they see. Um, in my new novel, I'm diving, no, or I shouldn't say I'm diving, Nolan is diving uh, in a hard suit, a mile deep below, and in, in a suit that's essentially a self-contained submarine. It's a very hard shell type of a thing. And what's it like to be in there? I didn't get a chance to actually go down in one of these suits, but I could see what they're like and talk with people who dove in them. So I'm getting all the stories from these people who've done a lot of these interesting things. So I. I don't have to firsthand personally experience you know, getting shot, but I can understand what it's like to you know, unload a Glock on full automatic. And so I've, I've, I've you know, been able to do a lot of question and answer sessions with SEALs, um, with a lot of different people in a lot of different walks of life. And so each one of my books exposes me to different people 
and by and large they're very friendly and very open to working with an author and, and explaining what it is that they do. You know, you make the writing and the research process sound so easy and interesting. Talk about the publishing side of things. Publishing is a nightmare. Publishing is, is uh, one of the most difficult things you'll ever do. It's one thing to write the book and that's um, I've done a lot of uh, speaking engagements to groups who, of people who are writers, who are interested in getting into the publishing business, people who are working on that first novel. And the first bit of advice I ever give to any of them is finish the book. Because that's the first thing that anyone in New York is ever going to want to see is the fact that can you actually you know, get through that first couple of pages and finish the bloody thing. You know, so you've got to get that done. Um, dealing with New York was impossible. And I, I actually self-published my first novel because I... I didn't know what I was doing, and ignorance is bliss in some cases because I did a lot of things wrong. It turned out to have been a, a, a good way to do it. It was a good education in the process. Um, being from an architectural background, I have no print experience, no publishing experience at all other than my, I was the editor of my high school newspaper. That was the full sum extent of my publishing experience. So after six years of having written the first, second, third, now I think I got to the seventh draft of Spiderweb. I got it to the point where it was a polished enough story and I'd really taught myself how to write and how to edit a book. I needed to move on to the next stage. I was unable to get a hold of a, an agent. I, I some, sent letters to a lot of people and no one was really interested in this book. Um, and, it, and it's a real cold call kind of thing. And it's, it's a hard business to crack into. It's a matter of getting it to the right hands of the right person at exactly the right time. Ten minutes later and you've missed a boat even though it could have been the right person kind of thing. So it's a very fluky business in terms of getting your manuscript connected to the right person. Um, so I self-published my first book in um, the spring of 1997. Um, and one of the great mistakes I made is if you're ever going to self-publish your novel and you create a publishing company to do this, and this is the way I did it, um, so I can control all the costs and everything, is uh, pick a name for your company that is pronounceable in the English language. Um, I did something being too smart for my own good. I chose a Gaelic name, Shanaki, which means storyteller, beautiful name, I'm Irish, I like these kind of things, it, it clicked well with me. Well, if you look at the way it's spelled as opposed to the way it's said, the two don't mesh up. No one could pronounce the name of my publishing company. Made it very difficult for people to order the books. Simple one syllable, tour books or whatever, something like that, that's, that's always very good. Um, so I learned that mistake. But in self-publishing, I got a chance to learn all the aspects of the publishing business. So I look at that experience as uh, a soup to nuts education in how to you know, write, promote, publish, package. You know, I had to design the book covers. I had to do everything that a publisher would have to do. So when I finally did sign a book deal with Warner Books in um, the fall of 97, I had a great appreciation for everybody who had to work on that book after I finished the manuscript. You know, so I'm a very easy author to work with. When I was reading through some of your materials, you talk about your agent. How did you meet this person and talk about your relationship with an agent? The story of publishing, I think you'll find this true just about every author that's out there unless they're very, very well connected in the business already is that it's, it's flukes. It's strange things happen, and it's, it's kismet that drives the publishing business. Um, I was five weeks into my self-publishing career, touring all over Michigan, doing book signings all over the place, and I was doing very well in Michigan. I was on the best sell list all throughout the state, and the, then the question goes, well, how far can I push this thing? How much farther into the United States can I get my books sold? The goal was to get these 2,500 books out of my basement into somebody's houses and break even. That's all I wanted to do. At this point, publishing my novel was like a viral infection. I needed to cure this infection so I'd go back to being an architect. I had no delusions that I would ever be Tom Clancy. I just wanted to know that if my book was sitting in the bookstore, if somebody came in and plunked on hard-earned money for it, would they feel that they got their money's worth and that I had done my job and entertained them? That's the question I wanted answered, and I didn't want to lose money on the deal. So I self-published the book, and the, the response I was getting back was very, very good. And I went, how far can I push this? So I went to the Book Expo America, which that year happened to be in Chicago, a nice short drive from Detroit. And this is like the auto show for books. A huge place like Kobo Center, this is McCormick Center in Chicago, just filled with publishers who are hawking all their books. And I'm wandering around this place for three days trying to hand my books to books buyers from different stores around the country, as well as trying to meet agents and publishers there saying, look, I'm on the bestseller list now. I've gotten great reviews. It's time to make me a fully legitimate published author and take me out of the lowly world of being a self pub. I could not meet anyone to save my soul. And on the very last day, I walked by this tiny little booth right next to the giant Warner booth, and it was run by New Market Press. And I got into a conversation with someone there, and they found out that I was an author and that I was from Michigan. And so, oh, our publisher's from Michigan. You should meet her. And I could see that she was working. I didn't want to bother her. No, no, no. And he drags this poor woman away from you know, a guaranteed sale to talk with me, the author from Michigan. 
We trade books, do the Secret University of Michigan handshake, because we're both U of M alums. I got a free book out of the deal, didn't think anything of it. A few days later, I get this phone call from New York, and it's Esther Margolis, and she's wondering whether she's going to, uh, what to do with me, is, is the way she put it. Dear, I'm having trouble deciding what to do about you. And I said, you're thinking about publishing me? No, I'm either going to publish you, or I'm going to represent you. And what she decided to do is become my agent. So I am a, an author whose agent is a publisher rather than an agent, who then represented me to other publishers who then picked me up. Things like this never happen. My, my agent loves to tell the stories at the cocktail circuit in her business because no one believes her. You know, it's, things like this just don't happen. So tell me about that deal. Well, I went out and, and into New York to meet with Esther in July of that summer. And we chatted and, and started working on our marketing plan. And for the next couple of months, because the publishing business is kind of slow during the summer, we worked on the proposal. She was very happy to hear that I was already at work on my second novel, Quantum, which later became Quantum Web. And um, shortly after Labor Day, when everybody came back from the Hamptons and started earnest work on that, that whole fall season and getting the books ready for the following spring, she sent it out. So I get this phone call on the Monday after Labor Day saying, well, dear, the books have left my office and they're, they're on their way and by leaving her office she means there's nine guys on bicycles riding around Midtown Manhattan with copies of Spiderweb and the, the early manuscript for, for Quantum on the backs of their bicycles delivering them to nine publishing houses and we'll hear something in oh three to four weeks. Um, not 24 hours goes by and I come back from a long run at this time I'm training for a marathon so I'm running 10-15 miles at a shot and I come back to my, my home my answering machine has had a stroke there's more numbers on it. I didn't know the numbers went that high on it she had been trying to call me the entire time I was out. I call her back. She's still at home in her bathrobe and slippers. And what had happened is one of the gentlemen who had gotten the book the night before read it that evening. The next morning, he's on a plane out to California with his boss. And as the plane is lifting off from LaGuardia, he begins to pitch the book and all the reasons why Warner Books needs to hire Tom Grace to write novels for them. And he, he finishes the whole thing off with, and to top it all off, boss, the book takes place in Ann Arbor. The author's a U of M guy, and the hero of the book is a U of M guy. The CEO of Warner Books is a U of M grad and a rabbit alum. He says, by all means, we must buy this book, pulls the phone off the seat in front of him, makes the call from the airplane. We commence negotiations between a kitchen in New York, my little house in Dexter, and a plane that's flying across the United States. And by the time the plane landed in California, I had a three-book deal with Warner. Congratulations. That's great. And I understand that you're now with Pocket Books, and they're bringing out uh, your two most recent books? and they've brought out um, Twisted Web and they're bringing out Bird of Prey in March of this year. The book Twisted Web, what's that about? Twisted Web uh, is a biotech thriller and the basic premise of this thing is we're on, the, we're on the verge of discovering a lot of new things in biotechnology and the biotech world is sort of a, a wild west kind of thing right now. Um, I kind of got into biotech sort of backwards. I designed the world's first gene therapy lab at the University of Michigan. In the process of working on this facility, I had to learn more about genetic engineering and medical practice than an architect should ever have to know. But I needed this information in order to design the facility. And it just piqued my interest as the kind of things that are going on. And now if you read the business sections, you'll read about pharmaceutical companies that are patenting huge chunks of the human genome or different microbes. They're scouring the earth looking for plants and animals and different enzymes and proteins and all kinds of things, things that can become the next big cancer drug something that could become the next big you know, billion dollar pharmaceutical. And they're looking anywhere for these things. One of the places that they're interested in looking is very exotic environments. Um, things like the, uh, the hot sulfuric waters around hydrothermal vents, be it at, at the uh, Old Faithful in, in Yellowstone Park or deep in the ocean. There are these areas that we thought were completely lifeless that are teeming with very rare exotic kinds of life. The, if you watch CSI, you'll see them uh, analyzing DNA in these PCR machines, breaking up the, the convex DNA and doing this. That whole process is made capable by a, an enzyme that's produced by a bug that lives in these high, high sulfuric, you know, 190 degree environments that would scald us and kill us. These bacteria thrive in this environment. So these, these rare microbes that are driving the biotech revolution. Well, there's this lake underneath two miles of ice in Antarctica that's the size of Lake Ontario and twice as deep. This is true. We're trying to figure out how to drill into this thing. How do you drill through two miles of ice, release a submarine to go around, and see what's alive in this lake? Because this lake has everything you need to sustain life, and it's been bottled up like a test tube for 20 million years. The pharmaceutical companies in this world would pay millions to get a glass of water out of this lake just to take a look at what's inside of it. And that's what the premise of the book is, is this is a valuable piece of technology waiting to be discovered. So we've got an exotic environment, we've got science, we've got money, we've got greed, we've got murder, we've got everything you need for a great thriller wrapped up in something that's really happening. Now, Bird of Prey, talk about your most recent book. 
Bird of Prey moves on to the commercial satellite business and people go, oh, commercial satellites, that's kind of boring. Well, you got to think about it this way. There are presently $600 billion worth of assets in orbit around the Earth right now. The commercial satellite business generates nearly $100 billion in revenue every year. That's a huge business. Real estate in space is valuable, whether it's geosynchronous orbit or whether you're talking about constellations of satellites. We all have our, our cell phones with satellite pagers. We, particularly the United States, relies on it. 95% of all military satellite launches are done by the United States, whether it's our, our uh, spy satellites, it's our telecommunications, the GPS stuff we all have in our cars, that's all U.S. military technology. This whole space initiative that the president has announced right now, part of that is based on the fact that people like India and China, China has just launched their first man in orbit, has decided that they want to go to the moon in the next 10 years. India has placed large satellites in orbit. They want to go to the moon with a probe in the next five years. Both of these countries have nuclear weapons. The fact that they can put very large objects in orbit mean they can launch a rocket and drop a nuclear weapon anywhere in the world. That's why the United States needs to get back into heavy lift technology, why President Bush is interested. The moon is a secondary thing. Going to Mars is a secondary thing. It's a fact of rebuilding our technology that we have kind of slacked off on since Apollo stopped. We haven't needed to do it. We got good at it, and we sort of stopped. And we need to grow the next generation of technology. And that's what it's all about. There's a lot of money at stake here. Um, on the moon, there's a, an element, a rare earth element that's plentiful on the moon. It's called helium-3, which we need for fusion reactors. It's estimated that a ton of helium-3 is worth about a billion dollars. You could put enough helium-3 in the back end of a space shuttle and fly it back here to power the United States for a year. This is essentially a semi-truck full of helium-3 will power the entire United States for a year. There's a lot of money to be made on the moon. That's why we want to go there, not because we want to put a couple of guys up there and play golf like they did back in the 70s. There's money to be made. And when you're dealing with large amounts of money, people are eventually going to start putting weapons in space. We're going to test our first space-based laser in 2012. It's going to happen. It's going to be wild west up there again. Greed, murder, basic human emotions take over again in the new frontier. Would you be giving away too much if you talk about the title? Bird of prey um, literally is a hunting bird. Um, a, a bird of prey is a hawk. It's an eagle. It's the type of bird that, that hunts from the air. Um, the, the premise of this is officially no one has ever placed a weapon in orbit. Unofficially, a few countries, Russia and the United States, have tested different pieces of equipment in orbit to see if you could attack another satellite, to see if you could attack an incoming ballistic missile. Uh, President Bush has reactivated what, is now, what used to be called Star Wars. It's now called nuclear missile defense. It never stopped. It went straight through Bush, one through Clinton, and it's back again, and, and now even more force now that we see countries like Pakistan launching rockets. I mean, we stopped uh, Hussein. Hussein, we were worried about his rockets going from Iraq to Israel. But what about India, which can now launch a payload completely in orbit, and they have the bomb? You know, so that's the kind of things we're concerned about. It's, we're not so worried about Russia shooting a missile at us. We're worried about these other countries that we don't have the gentlemen's agreements with. The timing of my book with what's going on in the world right now is incredible. I couldn't have planned this any better. I mean, I've had people say hey, it's like you've got a crystal ball in your house. But the kind of the discussions I'm having in terms of developing nuclear missile defense, the fact that it'll be private contractors that build these things in the United States, not the government that does it. Um, the fact that private contractors are making a lot of money in space, and there's a, a lot of money to be made in launching payloads, and why the American contractors, the Boeings, the Lockheed Martins, and all are concerned about the fact that China is getting into this business, that they'll be taking payloads away. Um, the fact that they'll have to compete before we pretty much had the market locked up. It was a few U.S. launch people doing commercial launches, and it was Europe. Now we've got to deal with, with Ch India. We've got to deal with China. Um, there's, there are other countries. Japan is getting interested as well in doing heavy launch. And, and there's money to be made. We're, we're talking commercially, a billion dollar a year industry in, in putting this stuff up. Then the non-commercial stuff is, is hundreds of millions of dollars as well. I mean, each one of our spy satellites that goes up, that's a billion dollar piece of equipment on top of a rocket. Now, the, the technology is interesting. The kind of things that we can do with the technology, be it reading a license plate from 200 miles up in orbit with a satellite, seeing through clouds, being able to do ground penetrating radar. I mean, some of the stuff we've done with the space shuttle has allowed us to find Inca cities in, in, um, that are covered over in the jungles. Uh, we find ancient cities that sank into sinkholes in Iraq that have disappeared you know, a thousand years ago. Um, and there's only like biblical references or you know, I think Quranic references to the fact that the city was smited by God and swallowed up. Well, we found that city finally. And it was based on radar imaging from, from satellites because we couldn't find it just walking around the desert. Now, I understand that you just met with a very well-known uh, producer, director. Tell us about that. Kismet's a very important thing in the publishing business. Um, so one of the things, piece of advice that I always tell aspiring authors is to always be nice to everybody because you don't know when it's going to come back to you. Um, 
never burn any bridges, is what my father always said, and it's, it's sage advice. Um, I was in New York doing research for Twisted Web, scouting out locations, because again, I like to go to the places that I'm, I'm using in my books to actually understand, get a feel for them. So I was doing some research on the pharmaceutical businesses in, in um, New Jersey, as well as some locations that I was scouting in Manhattan itself. And I was using my agent's office in Midtown Manhattan as my base of operations. And while there, I met a lady who was in town at a licensing fair, who just so happens to work for George Lucas. And she was having discussions with my agent on a book project that George wanted her to help develop um, that she was having some trouble understanding with. And I met this lady when I was dropping my bags off. I ran around New York for four hours. I came back, and she was still there. She was on her way out. We said hello again. As soon as she was gone, my agent dragged me into her office and explained this whole problem this, this woman was having with this book project and just trying to get a handle on what it was, the, the actual format of the book, how this book could actually work. And as she explained it, I listened patiently, and I said the famous last words, well, if I were going to write this book, this is how I would do it. And I began to lay the thing out. And my agent goes, you get this, don't you? The next thing I know, I'm having a breakfast meeting with this lady, and then a few months later, I'm having a, a meeting with George Lucas out at the Skywalker Ranch, where we're having a creative discussion. Now, admittedly, this is one of my childhood fantasies. The first time I ever tried to write a book was when I was 15 years old and Star Wars had just come out, and I actually, during the summer that it was out, started to work on a sequel. I, I, I read the book before I saw the movie because the movie didn't come to my part of town until way late in the summer, so my parents bought me the book. And as so I started working on a sequel, I didn't get very far with it. I was a 14-year-old kid, didn't know what I was doing, but I, I laid out some ideas, and, and some of the stuff actually happened in the next movie in terms of what needed. I saw the hooks that Lucas had planted in the first movie, and then he needed to, to fulfill on in the next one. I could see some of the directions. So here I am having a creative discussion with one of my heroes, and we're bouncing ideas back and forth about how this, the direction this book should take and the kind of things we should be investigating. And also now I'm working on a project with George Lucas that is tentatively scheduled for release in the spring of 05. It'll be the first book to come out under George Lucas books. And it'll be coming out just a couple months before the, uh, the next Star Wars movie. I'm writing the book. I'm the author of the book. I've been hired to write this book, so I'm developing the project. So the publisher is George Lucas, the author is Tom Grace. And I'll be the first author that he's hired to produce a book of his own. Um, and, and the idea of these books is these are fields that George is interested in, things that he, he would like to see developed or investigated. Um, and it's a whole wide range. The, Lucas, as you might guess, is a polymath. The, the guy has a broad range of interest, and it's not just science fiction and everything. He's reinvented the movie industry with the technology, the kinds of things that he does. Um, he has a very broad interest in history, in technological development, um, art, the whole nine yards. So this is one of those fields of interest is, you know, just some questions that he's got nagging is, how does this work? What really happens in these kind of things? I'm not really at liberty to discuss the topic of the book until it actually is ready to come out. But it's a fascinating subject that um, affects everybody in the world. You used a term that I hadn't heard before, polymath. What is that? Um, loose, I guess the, the loose, best loose description I can come up with is someone who has a, a wide variety of interests and knowledge. So someone who's well versed in a variety of topics. So he's very well read. It. I mean, the library at um, the Skywalker Ranch you know, would rival this, the Southfield Library. I mean, in terms of the number of books that are there, the, the type of collection that's available, all nonfiction on a variety of subjects, um, some very rare books in there. I was, I was very impressed when I saw the facility. Well, I'm so glad that you've made time to stop by the author's den. I know you're in the middle of a press junket uh, promoting your book. What's the public reaction? I finished Bird of Prey over a year ago. So then it's in my publisher's hands. It goes through copy editing. It goes through typesetting. I've read the book 600 times at this point. Um, I'm working on other books right now. I'm working on two different books that'll be coming out in 05, 06 range and developing storylines for things that'll come out 07, 08, 09. I mean, I've, I've always got several different things going on. So we're talking about a book that I've essentially been done with for a while, but no one's gotten a chance to read it other than a few people in the publishing business. Um, the best part about this is getting the reaction of, of real readers to what I've done, the finished work, now that it's done, and, and, and the reaction I'm getting is great. I mean, I've, the early reviews I've gotten have all been 10 out of 10, you know, gold stars, what, you know, uh, the ultimate cat and mouse thriller was one bit of praise that I got out of this thing. So I'm, I'm uh, very pleased with the response I'm getting because I, I think at this point this is the best book that I've written. Um, I, I keep getting better with each book, which is what every author hopes for. You don't want to, you know, have your uh, first book be the best thing you've ever written and then suddenly you have writer's block because you can't possibly beat it. Um, all my books are good and then they just keep getting better. The adventures are, are fun. What about the promotion? What do you have plans for promotion? Uh, promotion, a uh, wide variety of things, uh, both TV and radio interviews, uh, a lot of radio stuff around the country, particularly tying in with all the, the, the timeliness aspects of 
the renewed space program in the United States, our, our concerns about the Chinese space launches. I actually do have a Chinese space launch in my book. Um, that, that's how it opens up, was with the Chinese uh, sending their first three-man crew into orbit. Um, doing a lot of that, a lot of library, a lot of bookstores, um, and some schools as well. I, I speak to a lot of schools, uh, encouraging students to uh, find professions that they enjoy doing, um, because then it doesn't seem like work when they're doing it. To, to get paid to do something you enjoy doing is a wonderful thing. And the fact that I have two jobs that I get paid to do that I love doing, um, that I get essentially get to make stuff up out of nothing, um, be it a, a building. I, you know, both building and in my books, I get a blank sheet of paper to work with, and I have to create the whole thing. Um, it's a wonderful deal. And the fact that somebody's going to pay me to do this is great. So I try and encourage kids to, uh, to pursue those kind of dreams and just show them some of the fun that I'm able to have with what I'm doing. So you're really doing some traveling, trying to get interest in your material. What else do you have planned in terms of promotion? Mostly national radio. Uh, I do a lot of programs, and, and that's all phone interview type things all around the country. Uh, I'll do some book signings around the country as I travel. Well, Tom, thanks again for being on The Author's Den. And before we close our interview, I'd like to ask you one last question. I imagine you see a lot of first-time authors and writers. What advice can you offer them? The first bit of advice if you're going to write a book is to finish the book. Prove that you can actually do the job. Um, I come from an architectural background, so I don't believe that every word that I've written is pure spun gold. Don't be afraid to edit yourself. Learn how to edit yourself. Um, don't be afraid to talk to people. Don't be afraid to ask questions. You'd, you'll find in doing your research, you can get the best answers. Uh, most police sources are wonderful about this kind of thing. You know, going for ride-alongs and all that in order to see how police really do their work. Um, I got some great help from the State Police Crime Lab in doing DNA investigation. I got to go in the lab, see how they handle uh, uh, genetic evidence from a rape crime scene, you know, from a rape murder, because I had a scene like that in my third novel. Um, very helpful. Uh, don't be afraid to ask questions. That's how you learn new things, and, you, and you'll actually get better stories. Um, you, get, you get the human stories about how people really acted and, and watch people, how they talk. You know, work on the dialogue. That's something that I have a constant ear for, is how people talk, how they hold themselves, um, to make my characters seem more real. Um, I'm constantly interested in improving that. Um, in terms of dealing with New York, um, develop a very thick skin, because you're going to get a lot of rejections. I have the obligatory three inches of rejection slips. I could wallpaper my office, and people said no. Many of them are fifth and sixth generation Xeroxes, with you know, stamps on the things. Not interested. Don't want to see it. Um, don't take it personally. Um, these people are very busy. You know, there's a thousand new titles published every single day. It's hard to hard to get a break. Um, I got very lucky, and I'll, I'm, I freely admit that that meeting the right people at the right time. Um, but when those opportunities show up, you've got to take them. If it's you know going to a book convention where you can meet people, you've got to make sure that you get there. Um, you've got to put yourself in a position for things to happen. There are opportunities out there. You just have to be willing to take the chance and grab them when they show up. And that's how you win. I mean. That's what got me my book deal, was the fact that I was willing to talk to this lady at this book expo. The fact that I was willing to take on this chance with, with Lucas, now I'm writing that book. Um, you know, meeting people and putting yourself in a position you know, with your work. Because you're the best proponent of your own work. You have to be there to explain it, and then it takes off. Most authors have that kind of a story. You know, we all started in something else. There's very few of us who are professional writers, except those that come out of the newspaper business. You know, John Grisham's a lawyer. Michael Crichton's a doctor. Tom Clancy sold insurance. And we all come out of different businesses, and the only thing we have in common is we all devour books. We love books, and we love a good story. We'd like to thank author Tom Grace for taking time out of his busy schedule to drop by the author's den. Be sure to look for his books, Spider Web, The Twisted Web, and Bird of Prey at your local bookstores or public library. <laughs>